there. Wow. Man, that's hard. Uh... Right, let's go. Hello friends, it's day two of Liverpool Comic Con. I am so glad to be having to wear sunglasses. It's about uh, six degrees at the minute, but that sun is definitely out and it's not even eight o'clock yet. So uh, of course, first things first, I'm in the car and en route to Starbucks. I gotta get the fuel before the fun day ahead as today I am officially gonna be fangirling to try and stay composed, of course. Um, but I get to meet Elijah Wood today, so I am beyond ecstatic about that. Uh, I use the term meet very loosely, of course, it'll probably be for about uh, three seconds um, as I have a, a very quick photograph, which I'm sure I will look terrible in, but you know what? I get to meet Elijah Wood, so who cares? <laughs> Um, I will actually for the rest of my life because I will look hideous and remember that photo <laughs> but, but yeah these are the things you have to put up with when you um, gain weight and forget to lose it for three years so day two of Comic Con coming at you see you on the flip side Okay, so I've got the goods, albeit in a disposable cup. So, um, yeah. Like I said, I was in a theater class when the talent scout for the Everything Story came to visit her friend, who was my acting teacher. So she happened to see me, happened to invite me. So I wasn't from, I didn't have an agent. My parents are Near Eastern Studies archaeologists. Like it was very much not our world. Yeah. Very <laughs> cool. Um, so, and I was um, a dancer as well. And obviously after the Everything Story, I went into dance and I had a dance company in New York for 20 years and now I'm a dance professor. Um, and I have kind of a, a love-hate relationship, I think, with social media. I wasn't really very active on it. But um, I'm very interested in what I advised everybody that's interested in getting into the business. Myself, um, my husband and I, we were 
thinking about getting back into acting, and I was getting some scripts, but I wasn't very happy with them. And then he wrote a beautiful uh, fantasy film, and uh, director Rob Margolis is interested in raising the money with us, and so we're in the process of making a kind of 80s tribute, kind of mashup of Princess Bride narrating story with talking animals. I'm really, really excited about it. And so for me, it's kind of like social media as a way for me to produce the film, to, to kind of create a narrative that I'm excited about and be a part of something that's going to be great for disseminating it. So like all really powerful tools, I think it takes a lot of um, thought to consciously engage with it in a way that's productive. And Please make a link to the for the But I think it's here, so we're going to have to figure out how to use it productively. Well, like you said. Gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome to the stage Elisha Wood! you guys in just a moment but first of all how have you been enjoying comic-con liverpool it's been great it's my first time to liverpool i've never been here before i know i spent a fair time a fair amount of time in england but never made it to liverpool so this is exciting <laughs> that's awesome so visitations is a podcast that my producing partner and i we have a company called spec Vision. we make genre and horror movies and we started a podcast with a, a company called shudder which is sort of like netflix for horror um premise of the podcast is to interview creators, primarily people that are sort of tangentially associated with genre in some way, but it's really about going to people's homes or their workplace and sort of interviewing them in that space without a crew present, so it doesn't feel like a recording, and it's sort of almost like a, hopefully, a capturing like a fly on the wall of a conversation between a group of people. Um, favorite, that's a tough one. Uh, I mean... Getting a chance to sit down with Guillermo del Toro twice was pretty incredible. We met him first at an office and then we actually went to Bleak House and sat with him there for a number of hours. And, and you know, the, the, the thing that I love about the podcast and, and that episode is a great sort of indication of what it is that we were trying to do with it, was just it, it creates a level of intimacy and vulnerability that you don't often hear in interviews. And, if the subject's sort of willing to go there, it, it can be very re revealing without really trying to probe. It's just, you know, a group of people sort of sitting around. And we got a, a lot of detail about his upbringing that was so fascinating. Um, yeah, it was, it was incredible that he sort of allowed us that space to get as vulnerable as, as he did. It was amazing. I'm such a huge fan of this, too. It was awesome. <laughs> wow. There are some great times in the faculty. So we, we shot that in Austin, Texas. It's the first time I'd ever been to Austin. Um, it's a great town. I live there part time now. Uh, first time I went to the Alamo Draft House, which is a really great chain of cinemas that started in Austin. I remember going to see a uh, 35 mil print of Halloween there with my sister. It was really awesome. Um, man, that shoot was incredible. You know, it was a summer in Austin. Uh, it was a relatively young cast, so we all got along really well. Um, we weirdly, it's a funny anecdote, but we. So I went to Austin, normally, you know, you have like a, a costume fitting. So there's a costume designer that pulls all these costumes for your characters. And so went in for the fitting and all of the costumes were from the same designer. It was all from Tommy Hilfiger. And I was like, what's this about? 
And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, no, we're doing a, an advertisement for Tommy Hilfiger. And I was like, oh fuck, okay, that's weird. Uh, pretty funny, not normal at all. And so all of the cast actually were in an advertisement for Tommy Hilfiger, and it was directed by um, uh, Robert Rodriguez, who directed the film. It was a funny, funny thing that you don't normally experience whilst making a movie. But yeah, we had a blast. It was fun. It was really fun. Um, it, there, I don't have a preference. It, it, it really is, is sort of, um, it's ultimately based on the material and, and you know, the, the filmmaker or the group of the creative team behind something. I don't necessarily have a preference for television versus a longer or shorter shoot. It's all sort of relative, honestly. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but the idea of doing something that's 16 months versus three, your, your body sort of adjusts to the time frame that you're, you're, you're in, given, given how long or short any pro project is. So it's always, um, it's always a, a thing that, that becomes your universe for whatever period of time that that is. So I don't really have a preference. Um, I just like to work on creative projects, and I think, you know, a thing like Lord of the Rings is an extremely rare sort of occurrence. One doesn't typically shoot three movies at once over the course of 16 months. Um, I mean, even now with, with Marvel films, they, they typically shoot those things one at a time. So it was a rare experience that we could immerse ourselves in that world for that length of time. And I don't know that I'll ever have another experience quite like that. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I, I, it doesn't really matter to me. I just like working on creative projects. The length is not even something I, I really consider. Oh, from Dominic Monaghan. <laughs> I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, I felt that I knew something was up. Uh, so midway through, the, the, the backstory of that interview is that um, I had to be in New York whilst the rest of the cast and crew for Lord of the Rings were in Berlin um, for the premiere of, I think it was Return of the King. So they were doing their, their sort of press junket there in Berlin at a hotel. And I was in New York because I was hosting Saturday Night Live and I couldn't get to, to Berlin. So I ended up doing all of those interviews. I did them with them as well, but I did them all via satellite. So I couldn't see who was interviewing me. And so this, German voice uh, was what I heard and, and of this journalist, and then he started asking questions. The questions were really strange. And I was like, this is not right. Something's up with this, but I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. And I just, and I think I, I saw my publicist ask like off to the side if I should cut it. And I was like, no, 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 let's keep this going. This is too good. I don't know what this is. Uh, it was really funny, and then it was revealed that it was Dom at the end, he sort of came out of character. And man, it, it was like, it was such a wonderful connected moment, because I knew that all of my friends were in Berlin, and I couldn't be with them, so it was, it was such a beautiful thing to like, hear him. It, it gave me a lot of laughter, because it was like 2 in the morning, versus their, you know, whatever they were doing, at, like in the afternoon, 4 or whatever in the afternoon. So yeah, it was hilarious. But that thing has got legs, because it's on the DVD, and it gets mentioned a lot. So I just have to know, what is your favorite moment of filming from Dirt Gently's? Whoa, favorite moment of filming. Um, wow, the thing about Dirk is there's no scene that was just standard. There's no scene that we shot that was just a normal dialogue scene between two characters. Or, like, th there was nothing that had any kind of sense of, uh, of, of normalcy or it just being a sort of standard scene. Everything was strange and heightened and weird and other. So everything that we shot was hilarious and ridiculous and absurd in the best way. I don't know if I have a favorite or anything that stands out. I mean, you know, the first season, sort of the, a, big, a big first scene kind of like moment for both Sam and I, Sam played Dirk Gently in the show, um, was, was this sort of like back and forth ridiculous scene talking about how like the, the, the nature of this corgi dog and how the dog might, and it was so ludicrous. It was like two or three pages long with this back and forth argument. And it was sort of the moment that we were like, okay, this, this is sort of the tone of the show. 
Um, and it was sort of a great jumping off point. But man, we had so much fun. Like there, like I said, every, every single day was something kind of absurd and strange and hilarious and wonderful, you know. It was, it was really sad that we couldn't carry on. I mean, Max had a really good idea for the third season and we were all really hyped to continue working together because it, it had really become a family over the course of those two years. So it was a shame that we couldn't carry on because it was so fun. And every season was a different genre. It was, it was almost like an anthology, but all the same characters. So every, sh every season was going to be there, there in uh, a completely different show in a way. Um, yeah, it was fun. Um, who is the best person you've ever filmed with? <laughs> <laughs> the, the best person? Oh, fuck, man. <laughs> um, that's so broad. Like, Actor. Uh, right, now I, I, I figured. <laughs> um, right, the best actor. Uh, that's a difficult... I've been so fortunate to work with some incredible, incredible people. Um, Vigo's one of my favorites. You know, Vigo was... The story of him being cast in Lord of the Rings is such a, an incredible one. Because we had... Hired, they had hired someone else to be Aragorn, and it didn't work out. But we had all, we had spent two months with the other actor preparing, and that actor also had two months of horse training and sword fighting and, and preparing for the role. And the decision was made the day that we started principal photography, and they had to bring in someone very quick, and so they. They had this idea about Vigo, and they cast him very quickly. It must have been a whirlwind for him, because he agreed to do it, and then he came to New Zealand and had all of this catching up to do. I think two weeks later he shot, which is remarkable, having had, you know, we all had two months of prep and getting to know each other and understanding the journey that we were on and understanding our characters, all of this work. Um, and just sort of feeling like we were already at home in New Zealand with this crew. And he had to do that in the course of two weeks. And the degree that, that he sort of jumped into that task and, and took ownership over it and also became such an inspiration to all of us in a way that was true of Aragorn to all of the characters was just unbelievable. And truly one of, the, you know, my favorite people and... and you know, he was a real beacon for everybody on, on that film, both from the cast and from the crew. He was amazing. Okay. What is your favorite creature in all three movies? Ooh. I mean, probably the Balrog. Mm. A creature? I mean, someone said Gollum. Yes, Gollum. Gollum, I, I don't see Gollum as a creature, really. I see Gollum as a sort of sad, tragic hobbit that's been mutated because of the evil of the ring. But as far as the creature design in the film, my god, there's some incredible ones. I mean, the cave troll, too. Uh, but the Balrog is awesome. So rad. And you think about, like, I don't often think about this, but, you know, we, we, we started making those movies 20 years ago. And the technology has obviously gotten exponentially better over the years from a, a computer animation standpoint. But if you look back at Lord of the Rings, it still really holds up, which is remarkable. Um, it doesn't really feel dated at all. Um, they were really pushing pushing the bounds of what one could do with, with um, computer animation within the context of a live action movie where you, it, the blending of the two felt really realistic. So it still really holds up. What's your secret to survival, I guess, and longevity, really, in, the, in, in, in Hollywood? Um, I mean, I, I, I ultimately first have to credit my mother. I, I was, you know, I, I was raised in a, in a very, uh, quote-unquote, normal setting in the sense that I had a very normal home life outside of the work that I was doing as an actor. And my mom was obsessed with, with sort of drilling into me the notion of humility and not accepting special treatment and to not allow myself to have an inflated sense of ego or self as a result of, you know, being an actor. And I was no more important than anyone else. And this was like drilled into me from a young age. 
So it, it provided me with a, a pretty strong foundation um, of reality and allowing myself to, you know, I, I loved what I did as an actor, and I, but I saw it as a job and, and kind of kept it in its rightful place. So as I became more recognizable, there was a, you know, two things. One, I never became super famous overnight as a kid, which I'm super fucking grateful for. <laughs> and I think that's hard. It, anybody having to grapple with going from zero to famous overnight, it's a lot of pressure. And, and there's not really any tools. I mean, there are, but they don't sort of hand you a guidebook on how to deal with that. And I was lucky enough to have this sort of gradual recognizability slowly over time um, to where when Lord of the Rings happened, I, you know, certainly I wasn't as recognizable as anything compared to what Lord of the Rings became, but I at least had a sense of being recognized and understanding like how to compartmentalize those things. So that when Lord of the Rings came out, I'd see, you know, myself on the side of a building, but I was able to kind of com compartmentalize and contextualize that as like, oh, that's Frodo, that's what that is. All of that is to say, I, I credit my mom with that greatly. And then as far as, you know, making a transition from being a child actor to continue to work, some of that's luck too, you know? It's not, there's no grand design. I didn't have any kind of strategy. There was no strategy. Um, a lot of my career, certainly as an adult, has been reactive, you know? Just sort of following my heart and my gut and allowing that to, you know, guide me ultimately. And I think that those instincts just grow over time too. So a little bit of luck, great parenting, an amazing family, you know, good friends and a sense of normalcy and a relatively healthy perspective about this ridiculous industry and that I love, you know. I, I, look, I get, I'm, I'm still working as an actor. I get to do this. I get to make movies still and it's, I'll, I'll, I'll never not be in love with it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I've heard it what, before. <laughs> what's the most awkward interaction you've had with a fan where someone's like confused you with someone else? It may be Daniel, it may be someone else, but like, what's your most awkward memory of that? My favorite, my favorite is um, I was on an elevator with one other person, and you know how that can be awkward anyway? Especially before cell phones, do you remember that? Or when you didn't have a fucking thing to look at? <laughs> it was just you and another person, you know? Filling space but not talking. Um, so it was one of those, and I was standing in this elevator and I could just see out of the corner of my eye that this person was staring at me and working up the courage to say something. I could just sense it. <laughs> And worked floor after floor after floor. It was like going from the 10th floor to the lobby, just slowly, ding, ding. And I could just feel him like, and right before the, elevators op the elevator doors opened at the lobby, he just said, Harry Potter. And I said, <laughs> no. <laughs> I walked out. I just left it at that. <laughs> oh, that was very satisfying. I don't know. I can't. I, I haven't watched that blooper reel in so long, so I don't even remember what's on there. Um, I do remember. I don't even know if it made it to the blooper reel because I don't think it like sound was recording, or if it did, it didn't capture this. Uh, but on the first day of filming, we're we're running away from. Uh, well, no, we're Sam and Frodo getting knocked down the hill on the wooded road. Um, and we like go tumbling with, with um, Mary and Pippin and we're, we're tumbling down the hill. We all land on top of each other and I landed, the second take, I think I landed with like a pressure fart. <laughs> so like, it was a pile on top of me and it was just the last bit and then it, I farted and it was really funny. I don't know if it ended up in the blooper reel though. It was good. Does deserve an applause. It's true. It does My flatulence. Um, well, we. I love being in the South. In the South Island. Um, so there was an area just outside of Queenstown called Paradise, which 
we filmed um, sort of Aemon Hen, the, the, the last bit of the, of the Fellowship of the Ring, as the orcs sort of surround us, um, and then Sam and Frodo peel off. Um, all of that was shot in a, a place called Paradise, aptly named, because um, it's really beautiful. So that's, that's one of my favorites, just spending time in, in the South Island. Um, really loved filming there and spending time there. Um, Hobbiton was pretty magical because it existed. It was a place that they, it was a farmer's land that they had planted and, you know, grown gardens over the course of a year so that it would look like it had been there for hundreds of years. Um, so the first time that we went to Hobbiton was in January of 2000. When I had my birthday, I turned 19 in Hobbiton. <laughs> Oh, that was a long time ago. Um, anyway, uh, so that was a particularly magical location because it felt real. There was no, there was no place you could look and see a set. You know, everything was actually there, uh, as if it had been there for hundreds of years, which was a pretty Im incredible thing to see. And you can still visit it now. They, they actually, when we filmed Lord of the Rings, when we were done with Hobbiton, they took all of the facades away, but they left it. They left the holes there, and the basic sort of architecture was there. Um, and they gave tours, but the Hobbit houses were removed, so I can't imagine the tours were very exciting. It's like, it used to be pretty, but there's nothing there anymore. So when it came time to do the Hobbit, they, they rebuilt it all, um, but with, a, with, the, with an eye towards permanence and keeping it there so that the, the tours from there on out could actually look and resemble what the films look like. Um, and they, they actually, I think, expounded upon it and built an additional number of hobbit holes as well, so it was a much larger piece of land. And then they, you know, they built the Green Dragon as an actual place that you can go and have a pint. So you can actually go now, it's really beautiful. I don't know that this is necessarily a superhero trait. I've often said stopping time would be incredible. Just imagine how much you could get done. If you just stop time, you could sleep, you could rest, you could learn languages, you could do all this time, and then, you know, you could start time again, and you will have learned something and grown and done all this within, without actually having used real time. However, time travel, I, and I know it's not really a superhero trait, but I've been obsessed with time travel all of my life, and I, I, I think it'd be incredible to pop through time and experience other periods of time. It's, I, I, it's useful. I mean, it's useless, really, as a superhero trait, unless you go back and you change history, but that gets fucking dicey, man. I don't know if that's a good idea. I think it would be more as an observational not to mess with time, because then it like creates a knock-on effect, and then what is reality now? And I don't want to mess with that. It's just the responsibility of that is way too intense. My question's about Kim from Sunset. How did you get make him so scary? Because you were so cute as Frodo and all the <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I'm not entirely responsible for the for how creepy and scary he is. Um, I mean, he doesn't say anything, and he's just he's just a stone cold killer, you know. It was fun. We shot that over only two days. All of my bits in Sin City were shot in two days because it was all against green screen. Um, and then, it's funny because prior to doing it, I knew Robert because I worked with him on um, the faculty. And they were like, have you done any wire work? And I was like, no. <laughs> like, we're going to put you in, in a harness and have you do some kicks. And I was sort of like learning on the job. It was fun. It was really fun. Uh, but in terms of making him scary, some of that is, you know, white, whiting out the, the frames of the glasses and just the way it's shot. The cool thing about it, if anyone's read the comic, the, the comic was the storyboard, effectively. So I would look at panels of the comic, and, and Robert would go, okay, that's our next shot. Pretty amazing to have that as our reference point. And Frank Miller was on set as a co-director as well. It was a real treat. And I, it's not necessarily a favorite, but it's a favorite memory, just because it was so emotional. One of the last things that I shot was... I think it was actually in pickups as well, so it wasn't just in principal photography, although I may be confusing the two, but either way, one of the last things I shot was Frodo f finishing his part of the book um, in, in his study, 
before he goes away to the undying lands of the Grey Havens. And it, it kind of an incredible last thing to shoot. It's sort of literally me as an actor finishing playing that character. And the character's also finishing his journey in, in the context of Middle Earth. It was really emotional, it was heavy. Um, there were a lot of tears that day. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a pretty massive memory for me, that particular moment. <laughs> you, sir, at the Gremlin. Yeah! <laughs> Gremlins is one of my favorite movies. It's probably the best example of practical effects. Um, my favorite was when we would do forced perspective. So in the, probably the, my favorite example of it is when Frodo and Gandalf are at the bag and kitchen dinner table. And Gandalf is sort of insinuating some things about the ring. <laughs> and like, it seems really casual for Frodo until it's like, oh fuck, you mean me? <laughs> oh. Um, but the scene is the two of them sitting across from each other, but they built a, a large part of the table, or a small, rather, part of the table, and a normal size part of the table. And Ian was actually sat here, and I was sat here, and I would look here, and he would look there. But the camera was on a motion control dolly, so as the camera would move, the perspective would remain the same because parts of the table would move with the camera. And it was incredibly effective. You'd look at it in the monitor and it was absolutely like the two of us were sitting across from each other and he was giant and I was small. Um, they, they, the props that he had were tiny props for his hands so they would look giant and mine were normal and we were having tea. Um, and that, it was just kind of, that was pure magic and it's such an old trick that goes back uh, over a hundred years. <laughs> Um, so to be able to do something like that with modern technology, with a camera move, where the perspective actually stays the same, was so cool. Um, so things like that, using old tricks like that, uh, and see that they still work and nothing is actually more effective than some of those in-camera simple ideas. Um, and then I would say saying goodbye at the Grey Havens, um, the, the Hobbit farewell. Everyone say goodbye to each other. There was, a re there was real emotion in that. I think, you know, we had all become such good friends at that stage. And we shot it probably halfway through the shoot, but it resonated with all of us, that idea of having to say goodbye because we all had become family at that point. Um, so yeah, that was a particularly emotional thing to shoot as well. Before we let you go, can you tell us about any future projects we can look forward to seeing you in? Sure. Yeah, there's a movie, so I have a production company called Spectre Vision. We produce horror and genre movies. Uh, there's a movie called Colorado Space that I think has already come out, but I think you can find it on Blu-ray and DVD now. Um, it's an H.P. Lovecraft adaptation with Nicolas Cage that's unbiased, but I think it's very good and super psychedelic and crazy. Um, and there's a movie that I'm in called Come to Daddy. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, that's a real treat. Um, that movie, I love it so much. It's, it's actually written, has anyone seen The Greasy Strangler by any chance? Excellent. Uh, so it was written by Toby Harvard, who wrote The Greasy Strangler. Uh, it is a comedy come to daddy that, that sort of dovetails into these genre places that you don't quite expect it to go. Um, so that's really fun, I recommend it. And then, uh, yeah, we're, I mean, I'm, I'm a, with the production company, we're producing any number of things at any given time. We just wrapped a movie called Arch Enemy from the same director as a movie called Daniel Isn't Real. So we're in post-production on that now. Lots to look forward to. Yeah. Thank you so much for your candor. Oh, we so appreciate you being here. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen.
applause going for our wonderful ladies here. It is indeed a reunion as we have a very special guest. Give it up for Salem. Yay! It does it when it wants to and scares the crap out of me. It moves. It meows. Oh, there he is. Oh, there he goes. Wow. I love it. Oh, goodness. Um, my favorite episode is the pancake episode. Um, I loved that. I, in fact, the other day, um, I was trying to explain why my son is so addicted to sugar. So I was like, trying to explain sugar addiction to him. And um, I used the pancake episode. <laughs> it's one of the few episodes he's seen. Um, and I just love that one, too, for me personally, because it was the first time I really feel like I got to dive into some physical comedy, which was really fun, like digging through trash cans and doing the song, and we did like a song and dance, and um, that, was, that was one that really stood out to me. But I loved, like all the costumes and stuff were something that I remember, you know, being Cyrano and being um, Alice and being uh, Cinderella flying over a volcano or something. I'm like, wait, I'm in this strap, I'm strapped up in this halter, like, um, what do you call this? The, the harness. Harness, thing. harness, yeah. Had to put a dress over it, fly over a volcano. But of course, I don't see the volcano. You guys see the volcano. <laughs> all I see is green screen all around. And, um, you know, just all those memories. But also a lot of the, the memories for me are like personal things that were going on in my life. Like the day my dog died, the day my boyfriend broke up with me. <laughs> like there was an episode we did with a wedding. Was it your wedding or Caroline's wedding, Hilda's wedding? I think it was Caroline's wedding. Okay, and so there was an episode where Hilda gets married, and um, I was directing that one, but my boyfriend had broken up with me in like the middle of the night, or I had broken up with him in the middle of the night. I have to get that right, by the way. I broke up with him. <laughs> Just clarify that. I want to clarify that. But you know, so I look at that episode, and I'm like, oh, I was so tired that day because I didn't sleep because I was trying to lock him out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Comic Con exclusive right there. I love it. I, well, I'll go first. <clears throat> um, I think Caroline and I were completely typecast. Uh, I mean, we actually are the Hilda and Zelda. We really are in real life pretty much the same people. Um, but it, interestingly, you know, I really, it was really important to me that Zelda be a scientist, that she be a really, you know, because I wore a lot of short skirts and tight dresses and, you know, was kind of that dressed that way. And I wanted to make an example that, that you know, women can be both smart and attractive, smart and dressed, you know, and sexy. And I had two girls come up to me this weekend and say, I went into science because of you. And I think that's so cool. That makes me so happy. Um, for me, that's funny, actually. That there was one, um, I don't know what the episode was called, but uh, Sabrina gets stuck in her own bad mood. And um, that episode, I was in a really bad mood. So I don't know if that's art imitating life or life imitating art, <laughs> but I remember that week I was really cranky. And I was like, why can't I get out of this? And I wonder if it's because the character was in a bad mood the whole week and I just took that on myself. Um, but uh, I don't know, I think the thing for me is, um, I know a lot of people relate to Sabrina and the way that she, um, had this special thing about her, but didn't want the attention necessarily, wanted to kind of, I feel like she was always try, shying away from what made her special and, and um, felt a little bit like a misfit because of her magic and um, because of the secret she found out about herself and just sort of trying to um, just hide in the, in, in the shadows a little bit. And that was very much the opposite of me. <laughs> um, I was, am very much more like my character Clarissa from Clarissa Explains It All. Um, a, little bit, a little bit more of a, um, I don't know, I think a little bit more of a non-conformist, like someone that likes to kind of push the boundaries and be a loud mouth and, um, and being an actor, you know, we just tend to wanna, actors just tend to usually wanna, you know, be the one that everyone hears and be the center of attention and that kind of thing. So to play Sabrina was a little bit the opposite for me. So um, it was a little bit, I didn't always um, relate to her. So it's funny because a lot of people did. Hi, um, I was wondering who is your least favorite person on the set? <laughs> least favorite person on the set? I didn't set. hear that question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, you know what, we actually had I, you, we, uh, to be honest, it was just the most lovely seven years of my life, and um, we had an amazing cast, an amazing crew. We actually all got together a few weeks ago. Um, I just missed everyone so much. I threw a little party and told everybody, come on out. I took over this coffee shop at night, 
and we had crew and Jenna flew in from New York and we had people flying from Canada and um, Beth was gonna come from Texas but she was she was she was working and so you know we had like a hundred something people show up just the old crew and cast and we had we just had a blast Jenna and I were out till like two in the morning which was not what we do anymore but we acted like our old selves and we just had such a lovely time we all got to go Jenna told the story yesterday about how we all got to go do an episode at the um, Animal Kingdom at Disney World Florida and we were working in California so that was a long distance but they took the entire crew and we all went and we had a blast and it's just a testament to how much we all got along. Everyone really, I mean, there was We took vacations together. We took vacations together. We got yeah. tattoos we, together. We went to Mexico. We went to Vegas. Yeah. We, I mean, we we really all enjoyed each other. And you think that there would be some horror stories or something. But honestly, we, we had a blast. Yeah. There was one costume designer that I could have done without. That's true. She only lasted so long. It was a mean, so mean, meanie, meanie, meanie. We weeded out a few mean people. Yeah, we yeah, had to be like, mm, she got to go. We had seven years of pretty much. This, that's true. I forgot. To. Had, I forgot too. I think I blocked it out. We had seven years of pretty much. You know, out of 150 crew, we probably at the end of it had the same original hundred. You know, mm -hmm. we, some people retired, some people left for other reasons, um, some people got fired. But mainly, the only thing that really turned over a lot were the writers. The writers did turn over a lot. Um, but we, but I, th I don't know exactly what the reasons were for that. I just think it was to bring different blood into the show and bring different characters and that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, we, we honestly just had the most amazing seven years, and when it was done, a lot of the crew went on to retire, just like, we'll never find this again, we'll never find a family like this again, so mm. we're done. <laughs> yeah, it, I've been on a lot of shows since, and I know you have too, and it really, nothing's ever felt the same, no. no. And a lot of people on the show say that, that it was, it was such a family, it was such a great time, it was a great time for all of us in our lives, and we were successful on the show, the show did great, because you guys all loved it, internationally it was loved, and... Um, and we just knew we had something special and we didn't want to let it go. A lot of the times with TV shows, what happens, especially with actors, is you'll get, you do what's called a pilot. So you do the one episode and then it's a test. And if they like it, they pick it up for 13 episodes. So you'll get the 13 episodes. And then if they like it, they'll pick up another 13 for the back end or 10 or whatever. They'll pick up more for the back end. So every actor is kind of like, I want my pilot to go. And the pilot goes and they're usually like, I want the back end. And then when they get the back end, they're like, I want a second season. And when the second season gets picked up, they're like, now I want to do a movie. And so by second <laughs> season, a lot of actors are like, I want out. I want out of here. But I think we all knew how special it was, how wonderful it was, um, how much it was loved. And we just were, we were along for the ride. Yeah, I have to say that that's something that I think we all share is... Um, a gratitude for having been a part of something that meant so much to young people all over the world. Sabrina plays in every country, you know, pretty much every day in every country in the world. I could be swimming in the ocean in Belize and I hear, Anselma! <laughs> you know, so I mean, it really, it, you know, it's a privilege to be in something that's had such a positive effect in people's lives and that continues to, um, continues to affect to new generations even today. So yeah, We've had so many people coming up and telling us, you know, you were my childhood, which it was, you know, kind of our childhood too, but you were my childhood and now my children are watching it and so and it it really holds up it's a show that could be on the air today and it, i think it would be just as popular as it was when it aired it wasn't my childhood just for the record <laughs> i really loved my show melissa and joey i had so much fun on that because after sabrina when we were um when we were developing melissa and joey I was like, I just don't want to be the one. On Sabrina, I was always the one that things were happening around and she's trying to fix it. And I was like, I don't want to be the fixer anymore. I want to be the tornado. I want to be the one causing, I want to be Lucy. I want to be the one that's just a mess. And uh, with Melissa and Joey, I really got to do that. So um, I got to be, you know, the slutty lush who just um, does everything wrong. And it's just a hot mess. And that's, that was so much fun for me. I did a movie called Bad Actress. Uh, where I play an actress whose career is washed up and I become a serial killer and my career is revived. So it was really a ridiculous film, but so hilarious. I really enjoyed doing that. Um, and I have another movie called Two Step that I really liked. Um, as well as television and film, uh, I love to sing. <laughs> and, Great singer. Um, so I uh, actually got the chance to be a part of Wicked, the musical Wicked. 
And um, thank you. Uh, so um, I got to spend some time uh, on Broadway and also around the country and in New York, uh, Los Angeles, sorry, um, playing uh, Nessa Rose and Elphaba in Wicked. And that was pretty special. You always get stuck with witches. Mm -hmm. I know, really. I should, I should do a one woman show about like bitches and witches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but also, uh, I, did, I also did, got to do a, a pilot last year that uh, was really, really fun, and no one has ever let me play this type of role before, but I played kind of like a, honestly, she was super low, like white trash, very, you know, way too much makeup, huge hair, bad clothes, and just, she didn't really have any social graces, and it was so fun. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> Ken, this guy Ken on set would always, he was our producer, and he would always, he would always just do a lot of jokes, a lot of private jokes. I don't know if you guys ever noticed, there's a lot of references to corn mm -hmm. in Sabrina. Um, we talk about corn a lot, a river of candy corn runs through it and things like that. But um, the joke corn kind of comes from our friend Ken, who... Um, I guess corn means butthole. So, um, <laughs> so the word corn is in the show a lot as like a little secret joke. Uh, I had a lot of fun with them. You didn't know that? <laughs> I had no idea that was a thing. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not really not sure I approve. Now you're all going to go back and watch it to see how many references there are to corn. <laughs> um, I had a lot of fun. Uh, the episode that we did um, uh, about the crucible, uh, the Salem witch trials and the crucible, we were, we were studying it in school. On, on the show, I didn't really get a ton of opportunities to leave Westbridge High. You know, most of, most of the stuff that I shot had to do with the high school and, and things that happened on that set. So it was really fun. We got to go uh, out to the back lot and film this episode that was all kind of tossing us into the Salem Witch Trials and the Crucible. And, um, you know, Melissa had a ton of experience on the show with lots of costumes and different looks, but I didn't really have a ton of those unless I was being turned into an animal or an inanimate object. <laughs> but um, we got to, you know, dress up and costume for that one, and I just remember having a, a really fun time doing that. Great what was the spy episode? Spy. We had the one episode that was a, that was a spy, and, and, and I was like, Lydia, Lydia something knows a lot, and it, I had that bob wig. Oh, yeah. I just remember, I've never been more sick in my life than the week that we filmed that episode, and you can see it if you watch the episode. I mean, I'm already pretty pale to begin with, but I was pale as a ghost. They had me, I mean, I think that there was a cot or something that they brought onto the set because it was like... I actually couldn't be there, but I had to be there. And that's something that, that happens when you're on a shooting schedule like we were. You can't be sick. Be well, especially the first four years of shooting, we were there for 16 hours sometimes. So 16, 15, 16 hour days. Three days a week. At yeah, least. three well, days, days a week, week at least. Days. And it was, you know, I mean, and, it, and the crew, we were all exhausted all of the time. And I just remember one day we had this scene, this, we started the day at like 5 a.m., and I had to like do this whole prat fall down the stairs and do this whole huge comedy bit. And the crew is just exhausted, like, huh. you know, it's so hard to be funny when everybody's just like, <laughs> like watching you. So, it, it, you know, physically, it was a really hard show to shoot. The last two years got easier because the technology caught up. So the CGI and everything was a lot easier. We weren't. Uh, we got in the. We got in the good. We got in the habit of it. Like I still have so many people, even you know, professionals in the industry as well, bringing up the show to me, and they all thought it was a multicam live audience show, and I was like, no. It was we like were doing one of the few hybrids. Yeah, it was a hybrid. We actually took the. My mother was the executive producer. She found the comic book from the Archie comics and turned it into a movie, which then spun off into the series. And so it was like her baby the whole time. And she took the schedule that we had on Clarissa, which I'm not sure, I think it's because we were underage at the time of Clarissa, that we had the schedule at Nickelodeon where we rehearse Monday and Tuesday and then film uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And so we took, actually on Clarissa, we worked on Sundays as well. We did like eight hours on Sundays. But um, on Sabrina, we took that same kind of schedule because it was a comedy and it should be in front of an audience, which when you do an audience show, you, um, you rehearse Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you shoot a little bit of it Thursday, just to take the, some of the bigger scenes out of it. 
And then Friday, the audience shows up at 5 p.m. And hopefully you're done by midnight. But um, I know on Friends, I think at Friends, supposedly at 1 a.m., they bring in a new audience for the rest of the night. <laughs> I've been on shows where, like, all the Linda Bloodworth Thomason shows I did, The Hearts of Fire, yeah. um, she would deliver the script sometimes at 9 o'clock at night. And the first audience had already been like, okay, we're tired, like, they're gone. Like, so we just have to be there till three in the morning with, you know. And we couldn't do that. I mean, our show had little scenes. It was more like um, a single camera show, which would be shot like a, I don't know if you guys watch Young Sheldon or the Goldbergs, like those were single camera shows. Um, and so, you know, when you do a live audience show, you only have the audience for a certain amount of time. So if you have to bring the cat in and you have to change wardrobe and you have to do the special effects and whatnot, you just have, too much going on for an audience to sit there through it or even understand what's going on. So we just decided not to do it in front of an audience and do it three days a week. Really should have shot five days a week with our schedule. Yeah. But we did three days a week, but which was nice too because Monday, Tuesday, we get rehearsal, we get to fix it, we get to change it, we get to work it out, work out the kinks. Sometimes I've been directing some of these single cam shows now and there's no rehearsal. There's no time to work it out. There's no time to figure out that joke or that blocking and figure out how to best tell this story. You just kind of got to do it running done. So it, it was a nice schedule in that way, but it did make us, it put pressure on the shooting time. Yeah, for sure. But I, a lot of the time would request people, or my mother being the producer knew who I liked. So Blondie's in the first few episodes, like at the Witches <laughs> Council. Um, I was thrilled with that, but we had the Violet Femmes. Violet, that was kind of my favorite. What was that, like the second or third episode? I think the second one was Mando, mm -hmm. wasn't it? And so the, we had the Violent Femmes on, and I don't even remember talking to them, but I was like, they were my first concert, so I was like, I need Violent Femmes here. <laughs> and we had Violent Femmes, and like, I don't know, we, we had so many fabulous people. Like you said, so you were impressed with Johnny people. Mathis. Johnny Mathis, and we had the guys from Cheers, and I mean, yeah. like, people's kids loved the show, so very... Pe people that really would not normally have done a show like ours wanted to be on it so they could show off to their kids. Someone told me, they were like, how was it tap dancing with Dick Van Dyke? And I'm like, <laughs> I did that? What? I'm like, no, that wasn't me. And they're like, no, that was you. I'm like, uh, so I had to go back and look at photos. And then I was talking to someone recently about it. And I said, how do I not remember... Actually, the little boy from Young Sheldon, I asked him, I said, do you remember everything that you do on the show? Because you get to watch the shows back and stuff. And he said, yeah, of course I remember everything I did. I'm like, you remember your lines? You remember everything? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, because I don't remember tap dancing with Dick Van Dyke. And he goes, oh my gosh, you're dead to me. And <laughs> <laughs> He's a very adult little boy. Fair. But, um, but I was like, yeah, no, I'm dead to me too. Because I, how do I not remember tap dancing with Dick Van Dyke? It's insane. But I started to try to put it together. And I was like, I must have been trying to learn the dance steps you know, crazy in this production schedule that we were in. Plus being like 23, 24, I was like wanting to go out at night with my friends and wanting to be social and trying to think of like my personal life plus my work life. And with the tap dancing and like knowing this guest star is coming in and knowing I have to tap dance with them, I can just imagine, I don't remember specifically, that I was like so wrapped up in it that I was probably, he, he was dashed in, we did the dance and he left. And that was it, we never had an interaction. It was just sort of that moment and I didn't really get to have any time with him. You know, I didn't want to be like, what's up, Bert? You know, like. <laughs> the two that I remember the most were RuPaul, oh, yeah. who, said to, who said to Caroline and I, oh, I love you two lesbians and that gay cat. <laughs> <laughs> Being hilarious, right? And we had, we worked with Penn and Teller. And you guys know who they are, oh, yeah. the magicians? And Teller is, as you would think, quite retiring and shy and doesn't speak much, but he does speak. And he came up to me after like maybe the third or fourth episode and he said, you know Beth, I've come to understand what acting is. It's being terribly uncomfortable all of the time and pretending you're not. <laughs> and I said, that's pretty much it, Teller. That's pretty much what acting is. So that, those are my two favorites. And I don't think it's that Teller doesn't talk as much as it's that Penn doesn't shut up. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> He has a lot to say, a lot of opinions. He has a lot to say, and some of it you really wish he would keep to himself. <laughs> yeah, just so you know, like, in, and I, it's really changed a lot. Thank you, Me Too movement. But just so you know, like, there were a lot of things that women were under contract. Like, uh, several times I had contracts that said, if I gained more than 10 pounds, I could be fired. That if, oh yeah, mm-hmm. Which, which was really put in place to keep people from getting pregnant. 
Um, well, they were doing. Well, that's, I was pregnant once. It didn't. There was a movie out there. Oh, what's it called? I don't know. It's terrible. Don't see it. Um, <laughs> but um, I was chasing zombies or something, and I was pregnant, and I was advised not to tell. I was six months pregnant, and I was advised not to tell anybody. Just show up on set. And I was like, I don't think that's the best way to go. And they're like, No, because you could. They'll fire you. And I was like, well, that's a little discriminatory that they, they want me for the part, but they don't want me if I'm pregnant. But I also think they should know I'm pregnant. Like, I'm not just like a month pregnant. I'm six months pregnant. <laughs> so I had to wear Spanx to try to suck in my giant baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I understand the aspect of like someone being in your home, feeling familiar, feeling relatable. But on our end, you have to understand that we've never met you guys before. <laughs> so it is, sometimes it can be a little, you know, of course, the, it's, it's so amazing to hear and it's so wonderful and it's so warm and fuzzy. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's hard to give off an impression in like five seconds that lets you know how special that is to us when there's so much going on. Yeah, so if yeah. We, if we seem slightly rude or anything, it's not intentional. <laughs> but then we went to Australia the next year. And we just swam every day. I went for a run every morning while wallabies are jumping out. And we stayed on this little island called Hamilton Island, which I think George Harrison had a house on, I believe. And um, we just had, we were just on this tiny island, no cars, just golf carts and wallabies. And we literally are swimming. But one day there was, there were some scenes on a boat and we had this, the boat out in the water, the boat that we were supposed to um, shoot on that we were like, we were supposed to, the camera was on and everything. And then there was a holding boat, like a boat for everyone else, makeup and hair and wardrobe and whatnot. And they would shuttle us back and forth from boats. And I was like, I'm going to jump in the water and swim. And so one, so I went and swam to the boat. When I got out of the other boat, when I got on the other boat, they were like, this is shark alley. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but, um, but we just had such a beautiful time there. And I really enjoyed that experience because it was just, you know, sunshine and water and so much fun. And, and mermaids and mermaids. <laughs> there yeah. are there are certain towns where it's really hard to make a movie. New Orleans is really hard too. Because you're like, Can I can I order coffee for the morning? Oh no, Sean. Not too early for uh, no. We don't have no coffee in the morning. Mm -mm. <laughs> but you're like you have to get the producers to get you a coffee pot and then you're like, Can I have some room service? Oh no, Sha, too late now. Mm -mm, no, no. <laughs> No, no, try tomorrow. And so you're like, you're like, can I also have a refrigerator in my room? Like, is it, in New Orleans, they're just like, no, that don't sound convenient for us. We're not gonna do that, no. So there are certain towns that it's really hard to make a movie in. I did, I mean, There's a lot of stuff like politics. that that's, that's, that's on hold somewhere. Like, I, I keep wanting to do Murder, She Wrote, because I'm like, I'm perfect for it. But it, like, yes. I can be more perfect. But um, but the rights are like owned by the Angela Lansbury son and CBS. Yeah, well, as a Sabrina fan myself, this has been such a pleasure to relive our childhoods. Please give it up for our wonderful guests here. Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Renee the Eyes, Jenny Green, Beth Broderick, and of course Melissa Joan Hart. Keep the applause going. <laughs>bit of this vlog hopefully by now I will have inserted some uh, amazing footage from the last couple of days I'm literally just on the way home then from the end of day two sun is still shining I'm hoping that is because the sun shines on the righteous I'm just uh, leaving Liverpool for the final time for this uh, Liverpool Comic-Con 
and uh, yes some odd lighting is happening but I just had to uh, pop on before um, my journey home as my memory is almost full on well my own memory and the phone memory and yeah what a couple of days I'm not normally um, what shall we say, fangirl, a kind of, I can be quite composed and I was, don't get me wrong, but yeah, there's a few times that my Apple Watch has told me that my heart rate has gone a little high, over the hundred, even whilst I was sitting down, um, that may have been because Elijah Wood was talking, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, those are some lifelong goals right there. Um, I'm actually using my iPhone 10 now um, because the storage is full on my 11 and I've got maximum storage on both of these phones so I've been charging them up throughout the day and deleting what I could um, but still managed to just hit record and keep on recording just in case you know um, I don't know what I'll use or what I will have used by now other than just I wanted to stop by and say thanks for watching uh, if you want to see more from me, do um, hit the bell and to get notified when the next vlog is coming out. And of course, subscribe. Um, I'll still be here. Hopefully you will too. And let's face it, see you on the flip side. Actually, um, sorry, the sun can't be helped and I love that it's here. So I won't apologize for the uh, uneven lighting. But I do want to just stop back and say something else that yes, um, I went with Black Hoodie. Um, it means a lot to me because it's Adeline Morin and her girl supporting girls, Big Bop crew, all that kind of stuff. And at a con, it's helpful to have something loose and comfortable for the cold rooms, but also um, a big pocket at the front. <laughs> and you know I live in hoodies, so that was gonna always happen. Um, but also, Yes, I will have inserted by now the pictures of me with Melissa and Elijah and I do hate myself in them just as predicted <laughs> but that's my bit of history so I will own it and the final thing as I'm just driving home now um, I, I don't know how to explain this without being too um, I don't know female I guess it is today International Women's Day and no, women's, women's, International Women's Day Women's Day Women's Day International Day of the Woman <laughs> it's International Women's Day today and I feel liberated um, not just because I'm gonna go over a massive float right now <laughs> but also just from meeting 90s heroes this weekend and today listening to Melissa and the other um, women talk about the 90s and how things were so different but also listening to Elijah Wood talk and he's so well spoken and educated I didn't expect anything else I didn't know what to expect but um, such a nice guy very um, down to earth well grounded as well as insanely handsome and talented but um, yeah I I feel a little upset now and I think it was the anticipation since December when I bought the tickets to now it's March having had it it's all over with um, back to the mundane life now sorry that light is really um, bright I promise I'm not crying yet <laughs> um, there we go so yeah, I do feel like I could cry. I feel very um, like I've ridden a roller coaster today. This whole weekend has been hyped up in my imagination as well it should be. It's a great experience. If you've never been to um, an event, you should absolutely try it out and see if it's for you. Um, but yeah, I feel being ordinary isn't enough for me and I don't want to go back to everyday life I don't want to just sit in an office or a storefront and just say accept me I'm this because I just don't feel fulfilled unless I'm doing this 
and um, one panel that I didn't actually get to to go and sit down and see because I was in a queue for my photos but I did see a little clip of because it was on the big screens um, and that was the the two main stars from Never Ending Stories and I, I don't know the lady's name I should I'm really sorry I saw it many years ago I, I, I've forgotten but she appears to be um, grounded, educated and inspirational and um, that is one talk that I would have liked to have sat and listened to properly. Um, she was very different to her co-star, um, he had a very different um, view about things but she loved social media, she thought that YouTube was a great platform for people wanting to, to break out who perhaps haven't had their break or opportunity yet. She did explain that her um, rise to fame as it were was um, not accidental, um, lucky I guess and she didn't really know what she was getting into and she's getting back into acting at the moment um, through her husband and having their own productions which is amazing to hear but it was nice to hear somebody say that yeah it doesn't happen for everybody overnight you can be of an age before you actually become yourself and yes um, social media is and can be used as a great platform it is a tool to to anybody's um, venture uh, not just in the acting profession but social media does get a bad rap for a lot of things and probably rightly so in some situations but don't forget it is what you make it and I hope that I'm making it fun it's fun for me on this side and I hope you enjoy it too there you go my uh, ramble my car chat is over for today another vlog I'm gonna say goodbye again so this time let's see see you on the flip side um, all I need now is for my agent to call Elijah's agent and maybe we could work together sometime in the near future and if he's single you know I'll still be waiting <laughs> so um, maybe a girl can dream right see you next time